hello, and welcome to our Euronews My Europe Twitter Space debate. This is our first My Europe Twitter Space, so thank you so much for joining us today. Again, my name is Lauren Chadwick. I'm the acting managing editor of our European Affairs section of the website, My Europe. And so today we're going to be discussing the energy crisis ahead of um, tomorrow's meeting of EU ministers. As many of you know, prices across the EU have uh, been soaring. It's been brought on by a number of issues, um, including supply and demand issues stemming from the pandemic and now to the ongoing war in Ukraine. Um, there are a lot of concerns, particularly as we move into winter, about whether people will be able to afford their energy bills. And I know that this is something that many Europeans are very concerned about. So EU energy ministers are gathering in an extraordinary meeting tomorrow to discuss this crisis um, and proposals for how to bring down these prices. Um, I'm joined today by several experts to help us break down this energy crisis um, and to discuss how EU member states uh, can choose to respond to it. I think a lot of people find this to be really complex. So we're going to try to keep it simple for you to understand how uh, and what the EU can do to address this problem. So today we have Elisabetta Cornago, a senior research fellow on EU energy and climate policy at the Center for European Reform. Andreas Schroeder, head of energy analytics at ICIS, Independent Commodity Intelligence Services. And we have Bram Kleis, a senior advisor at the Regulatory Assistance Project. So I'd like to start just by breaking down kind of how the EU energy market works. So maybe, Elisabetta, let me start with you. Could, we, could you tell us briefly about how the EU energy market uh, works and how electricity in particular is related to natural gas? Sure. Um, hi, Lauren. Um, thank you for this invite. I, I hope you can hear me well. We can hear you, yes. Great. Thank you. Um, yes. So what's the connection between uh, electricity uh, markets, electricity prices and gas prices, and, and how does the, the electricity market work? Um, so in, in the electricity market, um, demand is, is first essentially met by the cheapest power plants, right? And then little by little, more expensive power plants fill in uh, until all demand has been met. So generally, wind and solar uh, are cheapest, then hydropower, then nuclear power plants, then, then coal, and then gas-fired power plants. And electricity prices on these wholesale market are driven by what's called marginal pricing, a term that I think more and more uh, people, even if they're not energy experts, are hearing these days. And this means that the price of the most expensive power plant, which produces, let's say, the last megawatt of electricity needed to, to meet demand, this is the price that, that meets, that, that contributes, that makes up the price for all electricity generation. And this is the case then for also lower cost producers. So today, the most expensive technology is gas, uh, gas-fired power plants, because, uh, as, as you know, gas supply has been squeezed by Russia already starting in 2021 in, in the run-up to its invasion of Ukraine, and even more so uh, since then. Um, and the thing is that gas power plants, we need them particularly frequently at peak time, when, when electricity is particularly high, uh, normally between 9 and 5 and, and 9 p.m., for instance, because they are very flexible, they can you know, speed up or, or scale up their, their production very quickly. Um, and because gas fire power plants essentially bid the highest price, they set the price for, for the whole market. And then the cheaper technologies like wind, solar, hydro, nuclear, they get, um, uh, they, they get essentially some, some extra uh, profits uh, because of this. But the, the system this way ensures essentially that first the cheaper producers get in the system, they, they, they produce and they, they plug into the grid what they have. Um, and then it, it, it's good from a climate perspective because you make sure that renewables are prioritized um, and it remunerates their, their investment, attracting more to the grid. Now, the issue is that today, because gas prices are so high, that's trickling down into the electricity market as well. And this is ultimately the, the issue that um, that, that energy ministers, that governments more broadly are, are facing today and what will be discussed uh, in, in, in Brussels uh, tomorrow, particularly at the Council. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, so exactly, uh, um, Brussels, for instance, um, the European Commission has put a lot of proposals on the table to um, discuss uh, what they can do to bring down these um, prices. And this includes a possible price cap on lower cost electricity sources, um, excluding gas, since gas is driving up those prices. So Andreas, I wonder if you could um, kind of break this proposal down for us and, and explain to us how would a price cap on renewables, nuclear, and other electricity sources that have seen high prices due to the market, how would this price cap impact consumers? Yeah, so um, I think Elizabeth nicely outlined the workings of the power market or electricity market design with marginal pricing. And so the proposals at table are essentially a revenue cap for renewable energy producers and all non-gas producers, so to say, nuclear, coal, and renewables as well. So for all of those technologies, you could set a specific price, or so a strike price, at which uh, um, yeah, the, the revenue cap would be set. And so they couldn't earn more than, uh, than that this fixed predetermined price. Um, and anything that is, uh, yeah, anything they would earn more than this, they will have to cede to the state and vice versa. The, the state would also cover uh, losses if they sell less than that. So this is uh, the design of a yeah, so-called contract for difference model where the state would bear the risk of deviations from, from a specific predetermined price. Or so so that's, that's being discussed um, and that uh, proposal lies on the table. And I, th I think there's high likelihood that this comes through finally. So member states are likely to decide in favor of such a revenue cap or price cap as you want to call it. And the impact on consumers is then indirect. Um, so it it would mean, um, well, it's it's a bit tricky to to say actually. We don't know yet because um, uh, we haven't seen that in the market. But it's uh, likely to bring down prices for the consumer in those times for where gas is not setting the price. Yeah, but still, I think most of the instances, especially in the winter, gas power plants are setting the price, so it wouldn't really affect the end consumer prices so much. Um, Elisabetta, could you could you jump in on on this um, particular proposal kind of do you, do you think that this is something that um, EU ministers will be able to agree on? You mean the the, the revenue cap for, for yeah. electricity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's there is some some discussion around that uh, because you know it, it it's it's kind of an intermediate solution let's say uh, on on one hand some governments were probably uh, willing to to go a bit further so to have an intervention on on the market that not only extracts the windfall profit uh, but also actually changes and and puts a lid on the very wholesale price uh, hoping that then that would then uh, have positive repercussions on bills so also lowering lowering the the price that the consumers face in their bill um that that is not what the what the commission is suggesting basically because this, the, the commission says that there's a risk that when you um artificially limit uh the the, the wholesale price first of all um you know you you need to then somehow plug that gap. Uh, if you look at, for example, what has been uh, done in, in, in Spain and Portugal in, in the past few months to, to, put, a, to put a lid on, on wholesale electricity prices, um, they have started to subsidize gas power plants because they were facing basically such high costs for their, um, for their inputs, right? To, to buy gas on, on the global market. Um, but those subsidies, you know, they, they need to be financed somehow. So, if, if, if you're trying to lower the, the electricity uh, wholesale price on, on one hand, then you may have higher higher costs for, for taxpayers or, or for electricity consumers if you put if you put that in, in, in bills as in, in the shape of higher uh, energy taxes. So that type of approach, um, cutting wholesale electricity prices as a whole is, is one that uh, some, some member states uh, would like to see. And then on the other hand, you have some uh, member states which are perhaps not entirely convinced by, um, by um, 
by the approach of, of, of windfall uh, profit taxation or revenue cap in, in this case. I mean, it's, it's perhaps a different mechanism, but the, 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 the aim, the objective is the same, right? You want to try and get essentially those companies that have been benefiting from higher electricity prices to contribute a bit essentially to public budgets and that, that need to be used to, to support consumers. And some say that, well, if you put in place such um, such revenue caps, then that might discourage additional investment in, uh, in, in renewables going forward. I think, um, I mean, first of all, uh, you know, that's, that's something that, uh, that I'm, I'm sure uh, that the Commission and, and governments are discussing also jointly with, with industry these days. And, um, but, but it's also um, one of the reasons why a cap would, would, would be set at a, let's say, low enough level to, to make a difference with, with respect to wholesale uh, uh, prices, but high enough so to leave some, some margin for profit and to leave uh, some, some interest in, in additional investment. So let's say these are a bit the, the different positions that we see um, around the table. Maybe other speakers also have some, some points on these as well. Thank you. So, thank you so much. Yeah. So um, we're, we're just having a um, few technical difficulties getting um, Bram, our third uh, speaker, to, to join, but we're trying to um, solve them as well. So uh, while we're waiting for um, Bram, who I see is listening, um, uh, but we're trying to get him access to speak in this um, in our Twitter space as well. So um, once we do that, we'll, we'll, we'll um, get Bram's perspective on this. Um, uh, Andreas, maybe I could go to you on um, this other uh, measure that was proposed by the Commission, which is a uh, price cap uh, just on um, on Russian gas. W what are the risks of this possible move and, and how could it, it, that influence prices? Yeah, so first of all, you have to get this um, decided. It's not that easy because it would involve um, the sanction regime to be um, uh, yeah, tackled and that requires unanimous, uh, unanimous uh, decision making and so I'm not sure whether all U East European states are in favor of this uh, price cap on Russian imports uh, so you would have to convince for instance Hungary but others as well and the disadvantage of this is that uh, there's a few Eastern European states which are highly dependent on Russian gas still. Even though flows are reduced already, uh, they are dependent to some extent. And um, it uh, is a big, big risk to them because Russia could, as a retaliatory measure, uh, just stop all flows to Europe um, if uh, Europe announces this price cap. And Putin has already made... Um, yeah, he already indicated <laughs> that he wouldn't flow any uh, gas to Russia any longer if there's a price cap on his revenues. So um, I think it's not that easy. Um, what speaks in favor of this price cap, though, is uh, that Russian flows are so low already, uh, so <laughs> you could implement this, uh, such a price cap maybe a bit easier now that uh, it doesn't affect uh, large volumes any longer. Um, yes, not, not so easy to, to agree on. Uh, um, so looking at the five proposals that Ursula von der Leyen uh, set out yesterday, I wonder if, um, uh, Elisabetta, could you, could you say, wh which do you think it are, would be the easiest um, for the EU um, to uh, decide for member states to decide on tomorrow. What what do you think is kind of there? Where's there the most agreement, and and what do you think would be the most impactful of uh, those proposals? Um, I think well on on agreement. I think we'll we'll see a bit also you know statements tomorrow at the, when when the energy ministers get together in Brussels. But I think one proposals that would indeed make a, a, a big difference, and we've already seen a similar one approved in July, is a target for um, energy savings uh, in, on, on the electricity market. So in July, basically, we had um, the Commission propose that uh, all member states agree to, to cut uh, their, their gas consumption um, between August and, and March by 15%. And uh, something like that is now being proposed for electricity consumption as well. 
and 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 something I think uh, that that's particularly notable and, and and interesting is that you know that type of target would not only be for electricity consumption as a whole, so you know that would translate into as consumers, households, um, but also businesses, industry making an effort to to reduce uh, power consumption in general, but also a target that's particularly um, uh, focusing on electricity consumption at peak time, right? That's where we need uh, most uh, power stations to power plants to, to come online. And that's where then um, gas um, consumption in, in, in the electricity uh, generation is, is, is particularly uh, high. And um, so th this type of effort, uh, essentially asking for behavioral um, change in, in terms of delivering energy savings, again, for households, but also businesses, uh, can be particularly um, helpful if, if made at peak time. Um, so I think these these type of proposals should be one that um, that can really reduce not only the risk of, of potential blackouts but also can lower the the pressure on on, on prices and and as such then reduce um, energy bills for for consumers. Um, Andres, why don't you uh, jump in on this topic of um, reducing demand? How how important do you think this is, and and how easy is it? Um, for uh, Europeans to kind of reduce their electricity demand as well? I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, it's crucial for the European Union and uh, neighboring states to curb their consumption because really we are at a stage where um, I think this is uh, one of the most critical um, yeah, contributions for us to um, reduce our dependence on, on Russian gas imports. Yeah? So it lies in our hands to tackle measures which come at relatively low cost often because there's a lot of waste of energy uh, ongoing at the moment especially in the heating sector especially in households uh, there's often more energy consumption than really needed so more like i would say a large part of the measures a large part of the savings we could achieve them at little cost um, in the household sector What's happening at the moment is we see um, uh, energy cuts, demand cuts uh, in the industry sector, and that comes at much higher cost. Yeah? So 22% gas reduction uh, from industrial sector in Germany, this is, um, this is an impressive number, but it comes at a, high, yeah, at a high cost because the industry is producing less and that might lead to a recession. So um, I would strongly um, speak in favor of more engagement of uh, more involvement, more contribution from household sector to um, uh, save energy because it's absolutely crucial to bring down our demand for, for gas this winter. Um, I'd like to move um, from this, um, this part about uh, reducing demand to uh, another proposal from the European Commission, um, which is about uh, solidarity contribution from fossil fuel companies. And I'm wondering, um, Elisabetta, maybe you could talk to us a bit about um, you know, how, how this uh, particular proposal could help consumers and, and what do we know about it? Um, do you think it's a good idea? Yeah. Um... I do think it is a good idea, but at the same time, I would say it's perhaps one of the most mysterious, if you wish, um, announcements that's been made Absolutely. so far. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, because it's, it's in fact, um, you know, as, as, as far as I understand, at least, um, really one of the points on which we have the least detail uh, so far. But um, from from what we understand, looking at, uh, you know, the, the, the statements by, by Ursula von der Leyen yesterday, um, the idea is roughly similar to the, the if you wish, the, the revenue cap for, uh, for electricity generators um, that have lower costs than, than gas power plants. The, the aim is the same, right? There are energy sector companies that have been making large profits uh, because of the very high um, gas uh, prices, particularly, but also oil has been, has been experiencing a lot of uh, volatility. Um, uh, through through the summer, uh, particularly, and so because of that, because they have been reaping very high profits, that that's why you call them windfall. They were in a way unexpected if you looked at market conditions a year or so ago. 
than the rationale now for, for, for many governments already, because some have been putting in place uh, this type of um, well, windfall taxes for electricity, but, but considering to, to expand them more broadly at national level, the, the, the rationale is, well, let's try and then get some of these uh, windfall profits in, in, via taxes or via this sort of solidarity contribution, but that, you know, ultimately would be, would be something similar, and use those revenues to fill in the gap um, that, that, that public budgets are now facing when it comes to helping out consumers with, with transfers. Um, and so this would be then the way in which consumers benefit from, from this type of intervention, from this type of solidarity contributions. It would be uh, essentially taking from uh, those uh, sectors of the economy that have uh, benefited the most from, from these super high uh, energy prices, think uh, oil and gas um, companies, and use those revenues to protect from, from increasing energy bills, particularly the, the most vulnerable consumers. And I think one, one maybe point that perhaps we haven't touched upon yet is that, uh, that that's interesting to observe in, in discussions by, by the Commission, but also governments, is that there's this increasing um, um, awareness of the fact that it's not only households suffering from increasing energy prices, but also some businesses, uh, particularly SMEs, um, that are really, um, you know, facing uh, skyrocketing energy bills. And so there's this understanding that a lot more needs to be done uh, through the winter to, to help consumers uh, with, uh, with this increasing part of their budgets. And uh, Andreas, um, maybe you want to jump in here. What, what do you think about this um, proposal? And, and do you think that this... Um, um, this is a necessary step uh, for governments to um, reinvest uh, some of this money in protecting um, vulnerable consumers. I think it's a sensible measure. To, um, it's important to capture these windfall profits, we sometimes call them, because they've been uh, they are made at uh, virtually no additional cost. Prices do not always reflect the cost basis, so there's huge profits gained by some corporations which they didn't even expect. So it's good for states to to capture these these benefits, be it through a tax or be it through a price cap or whatever. Uh, the mechanism has to be. Uh, yeah, designed in a way that it uh, actually captures these amount, and that's again not so easy. Oil and gas corporations are, um, yeah, <laughs> they are experts in tax evasion and uh, getting taxes to places where they are taxed less. Yeah, um, so here it comes to some extent to countries like UK, so outside the European Union, where oil and gas corporations sit actually and where they pay their taxes. France also has a yeah one big utility, Italy as well, but Germany, for instance, they don't really have big oil and gas uh, corporations uh, like producers also at home. So um, therefore, the thinking is more geared towards power sector and reaping the benefits uh, or the windfall profits that are made on the electricity markets. But it makes sense, in my view, to um, get this money and redistribute because the state is now... Um, yeah, um, they're intending to s design support mechanisms for households in need, so uh, poor households and so on. And uh, yes, somehow the state has to gain money before <laughs> spending this money on social policies. But these social policies are so much needed in these times to um, yeah, to prevent uproar and to prevent. Um, uh, discontent with uh, rising energy prices. So I think uh, revenues on the on the state side have to match uh, the uh, additional expenses. Thank you um, so much for that, um, um, for your point there. I just wanted to let everyone know we, we had, um, we are still having technical issues getting um, uh, Bram Kleis to join us here in our, our Twitter space. Um, uh, so we apologize for that. Um, uh, I, I, I wanted to um, really just um, highlight upon, um, see if we could talk a little bit about um, how this energy crisis kind of, um, what it shows about um, the green transition and, and um, has the EU kind of um, moved 
quickly enough to renewables? Has um, how could renewables kind of be a part of a solution uh, to the energy crisis? Is it a solution? I, I wonder, Elisabetta, if you could just um, give your thoughts on on, on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think it's good also to to connect, I think, this sort of emergency energy crisis that we are discussing to the longer term sort of climate goals. And, and so then the the shape that our energy system should have in, in the longer term to, to meet those climate goals. Um, and so in these, I think you're absolutely right in, in, in asking about them. What about the, the green transition in all of this? Um, I think that uh, it's it's really positive to see that um, most voices, most, most, most leaders, most European leaders have been strongly stating that uh, indeed the larger the role of, of renewables in our energy mix, uh, the lower the role of gas, uh, and so the lower uh, power prices uh, would be uh, if, if, you know, if we had had a larger um, share of, of renewables today. Um, but of course, uh, you know, the the objective is clear for the medium term, and I think what this crisis is 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 giving is a renewed impulse to actually go faster uh, towards that goal, uh, because we see that the the, the impact uh, that um, reducing the, the share of gas um, in our energy mix uh, would have is 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 a is a largely uh, positive one. So. On one hand, I think on the energy supply side of things, um, there's this uh, new impulse uh, in terms of uh, accelerating um, investment in renewables. Um, the crisis has also highlighted, I think, some of the outstanding challenges to, to actually do that. And, and, and for instance, one of the bottlenecks to, to increase investments um, uh, that, that's been identified uh, is, for instance, the, the very slow pace of permitting to put in place um, that, that investment in new wind turbines or, or new um, large-scale uh, solar, solar power um, stations, but also, um, you know, small small installations like rooftop solar on, on top of houses. Uh, and if uh, the, the permitting process can be simplified and, and sped up uh, without uh, you know undermining the, the, the environmental protection uh, that that of course sort of uh, is, is in place and the environmental checks that are in place for for those type of um, energy um, installations like like all then that would actually be of great help because it would mean that uh, we would uh, be able to increase our green um, energy supply in a, in a faster way um, Another, I think, uh, positive change that, that we see because of the crisis is, I think, greater uh, attention to how we can reduce then our energy demand. And so again, that means energy efficiency. So uh, I think there's been this boom of, of interest in terms of how do we, um, how can we reduce then our heating expenditures by better insulating uh, our, our apartments, our houses, our, our buildings. Um, but also I think, um, some of the, let's say, technologies that, that seemed a bit far away or complicated are now sort of household names. And, and an example of that is, is heat pumps. So what types of technology, technologies can we use to move away from gas heating and, and towards, um, and towards uh, electrify, electrified heating that, that then again can reduce our dependence on gas and, and particularly imported gas. So I think in this sense, we see this sort of Positive changes, of course. Uh, uh, you know, with, with hindsight, yes, we, we could have we could have progressed faster uh, towards uh, the the the, um, the investment in, in renewable energy sources, for example, or in the better insulation of of, of buildings in in Europe. Uh, but I do think that uh, we are seeing that the current crisis is a turning point in that sense. Uh, Andreas, do you want to um, jump in there and and, and react to um, what Elisabetta just said about um, particularly energy efficiency um, and uh, yeah. yeah? I think Elizabeth mentioned the most important point. So acceleration of the um, investment into renewables. We're seeing a big wave of heat pump investment now. There's a lot of attention at the housing and the, the heating sector more than 
there was before. So, but the, these are trends that we've seen coming already, but they are now being accelerated. So, crisis is a bit of an accelerator program, let's say, and um, so it has some positive note, even uh, as negative as it is. It has some positive element in that it um, steers more investment into these technologies i think and then energy efficiency is so important and um, something that has not been um, so much the center of attention in the past years so to say but now it's it's, it's the cheapest way of getting um, yeah of, of, of saving yeah, of, of it's the cheapest source of energy after all like the the energy that you don't use and therefore i think it just absolutely makes sense to to boost efforts to save energy and I want to um, um, recapitulate again. Like we've seen a bunch of energy crises already in our history. In the 1970s, oil shocks have been uh, an example where we've had a shock moment that has led to some yeah, revival of the energy industry and some new investments, especially, for instance, in nuclear technology, but also natural gas. Those were like emerging technologies of the 1970s. And I think we are now standing at the same uh, time of change or Zeitenwende, as we sometimes say in German. So this is now um, uh, another energy shock, so to say, which uh, might lead to to a boost for renewable technologies, for other innovative technologies, uh, hopefully. And then, if that's the case, I think uh, we can even take a, maybe some positive elements here from from the crisis. Um. I wonder if um, we're going to uh, kind of uh, finish up here um, with our uh, My Europe Twitter space. And I think um, what I wanted to ask you both kind of, are you, got, are you worried about um, this winter? Are you worried there could be shortages? Um, what, what are kind of your thoughts for, for uh, this winter? Yeah, if if I may just uh, chip in here, so I am I, I am worried uh, because what I see at the moment is um, we are seeing demand reductions in industry, which point towards industrial or deindustrialization trends, or even like reduced industrial production. That can have domino effects, uh, leading us into a recession. So I'm pretty um, afraid that we're running into very serious economic problems, uh, macroeconomic problems. And um, yeah, they they will have other effects as well. And th this is not sustainable. Um, I would really call on households to uh, save energy more instead of in the, just uh, placing all the burden on industries. For that to happen, we need price signals or we need other measures that incentivize households to reduce energy demand or make it attractive for them to yeah to to use less uh, demand and then i think if that happens if we get these 15 percent announced demand reductions then i'm relatively certain that we might uh, survive this winter uh, in one form or the other but it's maybe not as bad as um, as uh, some fear might happen um, I also wonder um, if um, if this is a crisis that that you see um, lasting quite a while. What, what what are your thoughts on on how long this energy crisis could go on, and and whether people need to be worried about not being able to afford their energy bills um, for maybe not just this winter, but years to come? Maybe. Um... Yeah, I think that's that's another excellent question. And um, yesterday, for example, in the remarks, um, Solomon der Leyen said that if you look at um, imported gas into Europe before before the war, forty percent of it was coming from Russia, and today that's down to nine percent. So in a way, that's showing that our dependence on uh, Russian gas imports is 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 you know reducing. It means that we are finding. Um, alternative suppliers to, to Russia. So, so that's, uh, that's in a way good news uh, because it means that we are uh, successfully reducing uh, uh, the, 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 well, uh, the necessity that we have to, to continue essentially importing from, from Russia. Um, at the same time, um, as long as um, we, we have to rely on, on gas and then that's increasingly going to be 
going to mean uh, liquefied natural gas to, to supplant the gas that comes by, by pipeline from, from Russia, the prices of this commodity uh, are going to be higher uh, for consumers uh, because, because that is the, the economics of, of gas as, as we stand today. And so um, there, is, there is this risk that uh, for, for two or, or three years, and, and so that means for, for two or three winters, uh, prices of, of gas and then consequently of, of electricity as well are going to be higher than what we saw before the war started um, until essentially our energy system manages to, to adjust and until we have additional renewables coming online on, on the electricity front, additional uh, gas supplies coming online uh, is in, in so far as that's necessary. But that means also uh, until we manage to transform our necessity for, for, for fossil fuels, for, for heating, but also for, for transport um, into, into something else. Um, and so uh, this is where the acceleration of the transition comes in. Um, and, and this is then where, again, you know, it, it's important to think about the crisis not only as gas crisis but also as an electricity crisis not only in terms of you know finding alternative supplies but also in terms of trying to understand how we can lower but also make our um, energy consumption smarter andreas um, i'd like to invite you to give some final thoughts from our conversation today so thank you very much for the invitation to this Twitter space, my first Twitter space. <laughs> and I'm uh, really happy to speak here. I think um, I stressed again and again the importance of energy efficiency, but also um, the, um, the booster programs we need for renewable technologies and other innovative technologies. And uh, I think we can cope with the situation now. We will get out of it, uh, hopefully strengthened, uh, but um, the winter will be harsh, I think, and there will be some disruptions. Uh, it's going to be costly. So hopefully we can manage the transition in, uh, in a form that, um, you know, with uh, smart policies also to manage the transition in um, in a form that we don't place too much burden on industry, so industry survives, then we don't have long-term consequences. Elisabetta, do you want to give some final thoughts? Yeah, I guess uh, the, the final thought is that I hope uh, three, four, five years from now, we, we will be, uh, I think, in a position looking back where we will say that was a turning point. That was a moment when uh, Europe accelerated the, the installation of renewables, where Households and businesses started uh, taking energy efficiency seriously, improving the, the insulation of their homes, and now bills are lower, our energy mix is, is greener, it generates fewer carbon emissions, and our, our houses are more comfortable as a result. So I think this should be the target we, we have in mind. Uh, it's not far in the sky, because this really is where, where our policy efforts were you know, heading uh, towards anyways. And now it's a matter of urgency as well, because we see that um, th th there are uh, political reasons uh, as well as uh, environmental and, and energy ones to go towards those goals. Well, thank you both so much uh, for joining us today for our My Europe Twitter space on the energy crisis. Um, and thanks to all of you for taking the time to um, listen to us for these past 40 minutes. You will be able to re-listen to this Twitter space on Twitter. Um, as well as on our website, euronews.com. And um, please feel free to look at our website and follow our website um, for all news related to um, this crisis and related to the extraordinary meeting of energy ministers tomorrow.